Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Kayfabe All Day. And um, today we're going to talk about the Sports Review Wrestling edition of November 1985. Obviously, Sports Review Wrestling Magazine was one of the family, part of the family of magazines, what we call the after mags. Uh, Bill After the, was the face of uh, Weston Publishing. And, uh, as far as its wrestling catalog, you had Inside Wrestling, The Wrestler, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, um, along with, you know, Wrestling 85 or whatever year uh, it was. And Sports Review Wrestling was actually, besides PWI, was my favorite of the family of magazines. And um, I've always had a, uh, an affinity for the Sports Review uh, series. Of course, um, I don't know much about... <clears throat> Where the family mag family of magazines uh, of Pro Wrestling Illustrated is, from what I understand, there's only Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Uh, the rest of the sister magazines are no longer uh, in uh, published. So um, we're going to talk about actually. If you excuse me, I'm going to go get my. Um, I wrote down a few notes here, so we're going to talk about this issue. It's November 1985. They, are, they were always about three months ahead of, of what was going on in real time. So, so this, pro, this is probably covering around June or July of 1985 or, uh, sorry, July, uh, August, July or August of 1985. So um, as you can see the cover here, pretty attractive cover. Uh, you have uh, the Freebirds um, with the face paint. Um, the, the rebel flag face paint that they wore at the Kaminsky Park, but I believe this is covering, this photograph here is from the Meadowlands. Uh, the Freebirds Night of Pain, it takes more than painted faces to be the Road Warriors. That's the title they also have here um, in the upper corner. Will Wahoo McDaniel save Billy Jack Haynes or will Billy destroy Wahoo? And that's uh, Florida Championship Wrestling. And then down here they have actually a... a um, a feature on Mid-South Wrestling, it says, it says exclusive area close-up, sensational Mid-South action. And on the cover you have Kamala, along with General Skandor Akbar, Kareem Muhammad, and Dick Murdoch. Now, so let's set the 1985, I believe, was a <clears throat> one of the biggest years for pro wrestling from a mainstream standpoint. Um, that This was the year of the Rock and Wrestling Connection. It was the year of the war to settle the score. And WrestleMania won in March of 1985. Um, wrestling was extremely uh, popular at this time, and it had crossed over into the mainstream. Uh, Universal Studios was featuring wrestling dolls. When you went to the Universal Studios, you get a free WWF LJN wrestling doll, and you got to meet the wrestlers. I went, and I met Wendy Richter and Hillbilly Jim. So, I mean, uh, people could not get enough of pro wrestling during this time, uh, so it had really crossed over. The WWF was in its second year of expansion. Um, uh, in 1985, you saw uh, WTBS uh, hand over the time slot that Vince McMahon had and give it to, well, not give it, it was sold to Jim Crockett for a million dollars by Vince McMahon. So Jim Crockett had merged the Georgia Mid-Atlantic Territories and now... It was for, he had a show called World Championship Wrestling, which was became the main stri mainstay of the National Wrestling Alliance. But 1985 was a phenomenal year for pro wrestling because it's one of the last years that you still have a healthy territorial system, even though by this point it was already starting to uh, deteriorate. But you still have, as you see, the AWA is still a major promotion. Mid-South is a major promotion. World class is still strong. Florida is still somewhat uh, um, uh, functional. I mean, they had a big event that year called Battle of the Bouts that drew about seven to 8,000 fans at the Sun Dome in Tampa, Florida. So you have, outside of WWF, there's still relatively a healthy uh, wrestling industry. So, um, you know, one of the features here in pro wrestling and all the pro wrestling illustrated family and magazines was a section where fans got to write in. Um, I don't know how many of these, you know, I, I, I figure these are real, uh, letters. There was no reason for, uh, um, the after magazines to make these up. We know that the after magazines, uh, oftentimes would, uh, create, uh, 
interviews with wrestlers that didn't really happen. But, you know, with the, the popularity of the after mags, I have no reason to believe that they had to lie about fans writing in. Um, so you have the, the magazine, the mail bag here. I always like that. I always like going to see what the, the fans had to say. So I'll read, I'll just read one for an example of, of the typical fan letter in these magazines. And this one is called, uh, Warrior response. I'm writing in response to a letter written Chris Ranke in the September 1985 issue of Pro uh, Sports Review Wrestling. Mr. Ranke claims that the Road Warriors would lose to both Kevin and Kerry Von Erich and Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez should they ever meet in the ring. He went on to say that the Warriors do not mean, do not know the meaning of the words champion or professional. This guy's an idiot, knows very little about wrestling or the markings of a true champion. The Road Warriors are the best thing that has ever happened to the sport. I'm a Von Erich fan myself, but I think they would be crazy to climb into the ring against Animal and Hawk. The Road Warriors are by far the best tag team in professional wrestling history. Their past and present accomplishments prove it. And to think they are both still young, with long careers in front of them, is incredible. They will rewrite the record books before they are finished. I wish they would grace Boston with their awesome presence. Keep up the great work, Animal and Hawk. Beth Sherman, Boxford, Massachusetts. So that's just an example of a fan writing into one of these magazines. And then you have a section called the Tadler, and this would be where uh, they would give um, a report of a match in a given area. So here's you know Charlotte, North Carolina. They they talk about a match between um, uh, Ivan Koloff uh, and and Nikita against Buzz Tyler, Brett Sawyer, and the American Starship Eagle, uh, or the Koloffs and Crusher cruise ship. So, and, and they list here correspondence of the different areas. Uh, that would write in and give you a report of a match in their area. So this one's from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, then we have the Inquiring Reporter, okay? And this one has a cool little uh, picture of Bob Backlund against Rick Martel for the AWA World Title. Um, and the little caption under the picture says, Rick Martel's held the AWA World Championship for more than a year, and Andrea Sheff of Montreal finds that surprising. One of Martel's most difficult defenses came against former WWF champion Bob Backlund. So there would, there would be a question here posed to fans. Like for this one is, what in wrestling has surprised you the most this year? And one fan writes about Martel being able to hold on to the AWA world title. Now I'm going to, um, just to give my background as a fan, I started watching wrestling at the beginning of 1983. And that was right around the time that Vince McMahon brought the WWF into the L.A market before mcmahon was here uh we had mike labelle's olympic auditorium wrestling which by 1982 december of 82 when mcmahon took over it was in shambles i mean it was nothing like it had been in the mid 70s early 70s and 60s it it wasn't even on the map um so i started watching wrestling very beginning of 1983 bob Backlund, mass superstar were my two favorite wrestlers um at that time now, I didn't even know that any other promotion existed, okay, outside of WWF until about a week after WrestleMania, the first WrestleMania, I was flipping through the TV and I was just, I had just watched WWF Championship Wrestling, which was the, the, the A show. Uh, this is before it became uh, uh, wrestling, um, superstars of wrestling. And... I remember flipping through the TV and, and seeing Worldwide Wrestling on Channel 56 here in, in Los Angeles, UHF, and thinking, okay, here's WWF Wrestling. But it turned out to be NWA Wrestling. It featured Ricky Steamboat, who by that time had become a WWF wrestler. But now, from what I understand, the Worldwide show was on a delay by a, a good couple of months once we got it here in, in L.A. But nonetheless... Shortly after I discovered the AWA, because on Channel 5 out here at KTLA, the Pro Wrestling USA promotion uh, was on TV, and they were pretty AWA-centric. They were supposed to be a cooperation between NWA and AWA. Rick Martel quickly became my favorite champion of the three, because I started watching NWA. I saw Ric Flair as, you know, he was the NWA champion. I always despised Hogan. Even when Hogan won the WWF world title, I was never a Hogan fan. Um, but Rick Martel became my favorite champion. And so I was a big AWA fan because of Rick Martel. So 
It's pretty cool seeing two of my favorite wrestlers at that time, and still to this day, Bob Backlund and Rick Martel. Now, by the time I was a fan, Backlund was on his last legs as WWF champion. Um, when I watch his videos, watch videos of his matches from 78 to 82, to me, the guy was the best WWF champion ever in terms of believability, credibility, and he was just, even though people criticize him for having this kind of all-American look and his interviews for being kind of corny. The guys just had that in-ring presence and his physical strength and stamina and endurance were phenomenal. Uh, and I just love Rick Martel. I thought Rick Martel was, he's still to this day my favorite AWA world champion. So they have a cool little picture here. Um, now this is an interesting article. And this kind of gives us a clue in the political goings on of pro wrestling at that time. And it's called We Accuse, and it has the, uh, the picture of Hulk Hogan on The Tonight Show hosted by Joan Rivers. Okay? Now, in this article, the, write, the writer, and I guess who's, who's the guy writing this? Um, it just says, We Accuse. And basically, their premise in this article is that the media seems to feel that the WWF is the only wrestling promotion that exists. So... If anybody knows the background of the After Magazines, Pete Pro Wrestling Illustrated, and its family of magazines, and the feud they had with the WWF back in the 80s, let me give you the background of this for newer fans. Before Vince McMahon went on his national expansion, uh, he officially launched it uh, in December of 1983 when he appeared on the St. Louis Wrestling, when his show, the WWF Wrestling Program, took over the wrestling at the chase time slot. Now he had already been in the uh, doing little shots in o Ohio and Pennsylvania before that. Some At some point in 1983, McMahon banned Pro Wrestling Illustrated and its sister magazines from doing photography outside the ring in Madison Square Garden. And McMahon created his own magazine, which eventually became WWF Magazine, but was actually called Victory Sports, uh, Victory Magazine at one time. And so the PWI family of magazines became nemesis of WWF. And during this era of the expansion from 84, you know, all the way through the rest of the 80s, pro, the pro wrestling illustrated family of magazines were heavily biased towards the NWA you know, and all the other promotions. And they were launching a crusade against the WWF, saying they were taking over wrestling, they were ruining the sport, which was true. And I remember loving that. I remember, I, even though I, I grew up for the first couple of years of my fandom, first two and a half years, only knowing of WWF pretty much, I quickly uh, became a supporter of the AWA, the NWA Mid-South World Class. And I started, was increasingly becoming disinterested in WWF wrestling as it got more cartoonish as time went on. So this would be a common theme in the, the PWI magazines, this kind of ought, this angst against WWF and the, uh, the machine of the WWF thinking that they were ruining pro wrestling. So here they lament the fact that the media is portraying the WWF as the only game in town. And for a lot of the newer fans, at that time, they only knew a WWF. I had only discovered the other promotions one week after WrestleMania. So that's kind of the gist of this article. Um, and then they would have these wrestlers. They would have this question of the month. And they would ask a question and have different quotations from wrestlers. And I'm sure these were kayfabed, meaning worked. It says, who is or was the toughest man in professional wrestling? For example, they have Pedro Morales saying, when I was in the WWF, the toughest challenge I ever had was from Don Leo Jonathan, the Canadian giant. I feared not only for my title, but for my life. There's nothing that this man can not do. Drop kicks, spins, leg locks with the power of a horse. I will always remember Jonathan as giving me my toughest title matches. Now, can you picture Bill after picking up the phone and calling all these wrestlers and asking them that question? So I'm pretty sure these are worked answers. Now, if you have any of these magazines, you know that one of the Features were back issues. You can actually order back issues of the PWI family of magazines by cutting out uh, this little, uh, you know, cutting this little, uh, you know, part of the page out. 
filling it out with your name and address and checking off the magazines you wanted. I used to do that. I used to order some of my magazines this way. And I remember sending it off and I remember I couldn't wait. I would check the mailbox every day waiting for this magazine. Then I'd get a manila envelope with the magazine. I'd be so excited. Uh, those are fun days, you know. Those are fun days. Uh, Sports Review Wrestling, Wrestler of the Month. In this one, they have Brian uh, Adidas. Adidas, <clears throat> one of the uh, world-class wrestlers. Here's some more advertisement. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter, uh, merchandising. If, if this is one of the reasons the Sergeant Slaughter left the WWF was because of merchandising. Uh, he wanted to get out of, he didn't want McMahon controlling uh, his character, basically. Sports Review Wrestling interview, they'd have, they, this one's Dusty Rhodes, where they would do a, I'm sure it was a worked interview. Um, <clears throat> this one, Jerry Lawler, a crooked referee is brought to justice. Uh, and you have Jerry Lawler here, the Mid Mid Southern area. By the way, 1985 was a very good year for the Mid Southern area. You know Jerry Lawler's territory. Very good year for the Memphis territory. That was the last great year they had from from a financial standpoint, according to Jerry Jarrett in his book, was 1985. That's why I said 1985 was probably like the last great year for the territories. Uh, and after 1985, you see definitely things start to contract in pro wrestling and it becomes all about the big two, the NWA and the WWF. Oh, uh, here's an article, Macho Mania, the savage force in the WWF. Um, and you got, uh, that's Macho Man right there, Macho Mania. So the entrance of Randy Savage into the WWF, uh, he was coming from the Mid-Southern area, the Memphis Territory, uh, took pro wrestling the WWF by storm because he was such a unique uh, figure for that time for the WWF. A lot of their hills were the kind of the big monster hills. The WWF territory as a whole throughout their history was really into these monster hills. Uh, and then you would, they would break the mold sometimes with like a Jimmy Snuka from 82, 1982. And so Randy Savage came into the WWF and the gimmick when he came in was that he was a free agent. And so you would have the managers at the time, like Jimmy Hart, Freddie Blassie, um, who else? Uh, you had Jimmy Hart, Freddie Blassie, Mr. Fuji, Johnny Valiant. They would come scout his matches. So they were building this up um, for a few weeks about who Randy Savage would pick as a manager. And then he, he shocked uh, people by picking uh, Elizabeth, who was his wife. And, and of course, the, uh, that's historical, you know, because... Uh, that became, uh, you know, a legendary combination there, Randy Macho Man Savage and Miss Elizabeth. But Randy Savage took the WWF by storm. He was, um, you know, in pro wrestling, uh, you have to continually change, have turnover of talent to keep things interesting. So getting Macho Man definitely added an intriguing uh, piece to the heel puzzle in the WWF. So there's an article about that. So some pictures. And this one, will Wahoo McDaniel save Billy Jack Haynes? And this is, uh, you know, Wahoo at the time and Billy Jack, they're both in the Florida Territory. Um, the Florida Territory uh, had been through some upheaval the year before and even at the beginning of 1985. Now, in 1984, after a big card at the Miami Orange Bowl called Lord of the Rings, Dusty Rhodes left Florida champ championship wrestling from Florida and became a full-time booker and wrestler for the Mid-Atlantic territory of Jim Crockett, which eventually evolved into world championship wrestling in 1985. So that was a big upheaval because Rhodes was the big draw of Florida wrestling and he took some of the wrestlers with him like Rotundo, Barry Windham, who didn't last long there. They went to WWF, um, uh, Ron Bass, J.J. Dillon. And then in January of 1985, the, the, the promoter for Florida cha Championship Wrestling from Florida, uh, Eddie Graham, killed himself. So uh, Florida had been through kind of a lot, but they still had some good names in 1985. And uh, again, they drew seven to 8,000 fans at the Sun Dome for their first battle of the bouts. So um, 1985, even though they had, uh, it wasn't, they weren't in the glory days of Florida wrestling because in the 1970s, in the uh, early mid 70s, Florida championship wrestling from Florida was probably 
uh, the most successful NWA promotion. Uh, that was a big, ter big time territory during that time. Now this is the uh, on the cover. You see the Road Warriors and the Freebirds. Well, this is the article. Uh, it takes more than painted pa painted faces to be the Road Warriors, and this features an article and, and shows some pictures of the Roadies and the Freebirds wrestling at the uh, Meadowlands. Now the Meadowlands uh, in 1985, um, even in 1986, was a big um, uh, arena for the Pro Wrestling USA conglomerate. Now, Pro Wrestling USA was a cooperation of the NAWA as well as uh, the NWA. And in, in, at one time, the Pro Wrestling USA group featured uh, Jerry Jarrett, Memphis, uh, uh, Crockett for the Carolinas, uh, Vern Gagne in the AWA. Uh, Gary Juster was the, the Northeast kind of a promoter. But I think even Bill Watts was part of the first TV tapings. Bill Watts was of Mid-South. Uh, I believe Eddie Graham was and possibly even um, Ole in Georgia. Uh, but by 1985, it was pretty much uh, Crockett and Gagne. But So the Meadowlands cards would feature uh, talent from both Crockett and Gagne, sometimes from other areas like you know Memphis. And so you would get these um, star-studded cards at the Meadowlands. And for the most part, they drew well. They drew very well at most of the Meadowlands cards. And so uh, the Road Wars were big favorites in the Meadowlands. And you, and you have here the, the Road Wars against the Freebirds featured. I always thought that was a cool rivalry. Uh, in 1985, you know, at Kaminsky Park, uh, big match. So the Road Wars and Freebirds were one of the, like those kind of uh, – special big time tag team matches in 1985. Now this one here you have the exclusive area close up on the mid south. Uh mid south in 1985 um had great talent Hacksaw Butch Reed, Dutch Mantel, of course Ted DiBiase, Dr. Death Steve Williams, Terry Taylor, the Fantastics. Um I believe even the Rock and Roll Express up until the summer of 85 then they went to Crockett well, the fan, yeah, the Fantastics, they were in world class. Rock and roll was in Mid-South. And then the Midnight Express was in world class. And then I think at some point the Fantastics ended up back up in Mid-South, but I don't know if that was till 86. Well, they were on this card. So the, you have the Fantastics, Butch Reed, again, like I said, Brickhouse Brown, Dick Murdoch, Hacksaw Doug and Kamala. And so they feature two outdoor cards in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And they have some pictures here. Of some of the matches now I have um, on DVD or it might have been on YouTube but there's actually a something called WrestleFest 85 I think it's from Tulsa Oklahoma and it's an outdoor event it's supposed to be like a big event and uh, this might have been one of them uh, the Barbarian you have the Barbarian Jake the Snake Roberts now <clears throat> Mid South and there's uh, the you know Kamala Kareem Muhammad, Mid-South in 1985, very solid. Um, they had a big 1984. Mid-South, like 1984 is probably their most successful year. And that's because they had the big feud with the, the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express. Junkyard Dog was still there for much, much of the year. But I believe it was August of 84 that Junkyard Dog left to the WWF and Mid-South was never the same. We know Watts tried to replace Junkyard Dog with people like uh, Master G, uh, the Snowman, even maybe even to a lesser extent Brickhouse Brown, even Butch Reed. But um, he can never replace Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog was kind of like the Hulk Hogan of the Mid South area. But nonetheless, they were still strong in 1985, and and they would make a move to expand in 1986. So this was always one of a favorite of these magazines of the the PWI family of magazines, the Ratings Analysis. Okay, so the ratings analysis, they give you the top 10 of all the, the, the major, mid-major, and even smaller uh, territories that were prominent. So here's what they look like. This one has my favorite champion, Rick Martel. I love that AWA belt right there. I love it. Now, yeah, to me, Rick Martel was like the epitome of a wrestling champion. Uh, now, in 1985, there was a controversy among the PWI magazines. They had stripped... Hulk Hogan of world title status because they said that the WWF championship was 
primarily just being defended within, within its own territory, whereas usually world champions would have a few outside dates going to other, especially, well, especially we know the NWA, that's what their champion did. But even WWF and AWA champion, uh, before the, the takeover, the expansion of McMahon, they would go and wrestle some outside dates in other territories. So at some point, uh, they took away world title status from the WWF. That was a big controversy. Um, and you know what? <clears throat> at that time, the pro wrestling illustrated family of magazines had a lot of influence in the wrestling community. So that was a big deal, believe it or not. By this issue, and this now they're, like I said, they're three months uh, ahead of schedule as far as it's the November issue. So the ratings period ends August 14th, 1985. And by this time, they have restored world title status to the WWF. And they actually have Hulk Hogan rated in the top 10, number two behind Ric Flair, which I do not like. I believe Rick Martel should have been number two. Um, Rick Martel, uh, he wrestled a wide variety of, of wrestlers. He wrestled Rick, Rick Flair in a world title versus title match in Japan, which I have. Awesome match, man. If you want to see a great match, world title versus world title, Japan, Rick Martel versus Rick Flair. It's a shame they couldn't put that at Kaminsky Park on the Super Clash card. So you have the top 10 and Rick Flair is at number one, Hulk Hogan number two, Martel three, uh, you know, the world champions. And then you have Dusty Rhodes four. Magnum TA5, Kerry Von Erich 6, Rick Steamboat 7, Nikita Koloff 8, Sergeant Slaughter, who was the America's champion, the forgot long forgotten title that the AWA had implemented as their secondary title to kind of be equal to the Intercontinental and the United States title, and Kevin Von Erich 10. The tag teams, they have the Road Warriors at the top, the AWA World Champions, the next NWA World Champions, the Rock and Roll Express. Then they have third, Barry Wyndham and Mike Rotundo, WWF World Tag Team Champions. I always loved that combination. They were my favorite WWF champions, the U.S. Express, Rotundo, and Wyndham. Okay. Um, and so <clears throat> I won't go through all the tag teams, but you have in order, you have the NWA, the AWA, and WWF, the three major promotions in their top tens. And they would, in these promotions, they would have the champion, and then they would rate the top ten under them. Now, you got to remember with the NWA, still at this point in 1985, NWA is a group of local promotions. It's not like WWF and AWA, which are just one big promotion. Um, they're, you know, The AWA was just one territory, as was WWF, but they were big. With the NWA, it's made up of a bunch of different territories. Even though by this time, Jim Crockett's World Championship Wrestling is becoming within itself a major territory promotion. So the NWA ratings reflect the territorial nature of uh, the NWA. So you have featured in their top 10 uh, black, I mean, uh, Rick Rude from Florida, uh, uh, Kerry Von Eric from Texas, Iceman Parsons from Texas, Brian Adidas from Texas, and Jerry Blackwell, who is the Missouri champion. And then you have uh, the world championship area, which was Crockett's promotion. Okay. They're the main, they're the biggest promotion of the NWA. And soon they would become basically one and the same with the NWA. You have Missouri here. I was always intrigued by the Missouri ratings. Now, Missouri by this time <clears throat> became pretty much, they were no longer its own promotion. Missouri had always been a one city promotion, and that was St. Louis. So it always was pretty much known as the St. Louis Territory. But in 1983, McMahon took over their time slot. So when they re- uh, when they basically reconvened, Missouri just be basically became the, the, a TV show that was made up of three TV shows, World Class, AWA, and Central States, because Fritz, Vern Gagne, and Bob Geigel all own stakes in the Missouri promotion. So they no longer have their own TV show, but they would just basically work off the three shows of the World Class, AWA, and Central States. <laughs> and then you have the Pacific Northwest. Here. Now, the Northwest, uh, there were rumors, at least uh, Dave Meltzer was talking about it in the Observer newsletters of that time, of them shutting down, shutting down. But to the contrary, they actually had a big event in May of 1985 at the Coliseum in Portland, and Roddy Piper, uh, 
uh, actually headlined the show and wrestled Buddy Rose. And you had the Road Warriors from the AWA, Rick Martel from the AWA, and then the main event was a Ric Flair versus Billy Jack Kane. So they had a big show at the Coliseum, a Don Owens 60th anniversary, and they actually sold out at 12,000. So they actually had a good year. This was probably Portland's last really very uh, last real good year. And then you have Mid-South, World Class. Again, both strong promotions in 1985. Florida was still doing good, at least, you know, uh, relatively speaking. And then you have Mid-Southern. Um, and they had a very good year in 1985. In fact, Jerry Jarrett says in his book it was their last great year from a financial standpoint. Then you have the most popular, most hated ratings. Piper's the most hated. Uh, um, and then Hogan's the most popular, followed by Megan T.A., Kerry Von Erich, Dusty Rhodes, Martell at number five. Von Eric, Kevin Von Eric at six, Sergeant Slaughter at seven, Tito Santana at eight, Wahoo at nine, and Terry Taylor at ten. Now, let's talk about the most popular ratings now. <clears throat> um, Kerry Von Eric's at number three. Now, Kerry Von Eric in 1985 was extremely popular. If you watch the Super Clash 85 show at Kaminsky Park, he gets a huge pop. Um, 1985 is really the last great year for Kerry Von Erich as a draw um, because, you know, 1986 has a lot of issues for world-class wrestling as a whole and the Von Erich family in general and Kerry, uh, Kerry Von Erich in particular. So 1985 would be his last great year as a draw. Um, he still performed very well after that. I mean, even uh, when he came back uh, and he had his prosthesis, he put on great matches with Jerry Lawler. So... Much credit to Kerry Von Erich for that. But um, this is really, I mean, it's too bad because he's super young and he had just a great look, great natural charisma. Uh, so he's featured here at number three and that would change in the coming years. Sergeant Slaughter's at number seven. Now I want to talk about Sergeant Slaughter. Sergeant Slaughter was unreal popular in 1984 due to his baby face turn and taking advantage of the the kind of um the patriotism at the time and kind of the angst that America had because of the I the Iran hostage crisis and Sergeant Slaughter rode that wave of popularity had amazing matches with the Iron Sheik culminating in the boot camp match at Madison Square Garden that was just great match Hugely popular. Now, in the end of 1984, Slaughter has a falling out with Vince McMahon over his LGN wrestling doll. Slaughter wants a piece, I, I believe, of the uh, merchandising. He also I, apparently wanted to create a union. So uh, he's basically gone from the WWF by December of 84. Goes into Pro Wrestling USA, the newly formed Pro Wrestling U USA, which is pretty much led by Vern Gagne. Now, when the, he arrived in the AWA, surprisingly, Sergeant Slaughter didn't catch on right away. I get the, you know, you got to remember this is young in the WWF's national expansion. So the AWA fans probably hadn't seen Sar Slaughter's babyface turn in the WWF. Okay. So Slaughter comes to the AWA and they, again, they probably hadn't seen a lot of his WWF stuff where he did his babyface turn, his boot camp matches against the Iron Sheik. And so he didn't really catch on right away. In fact, Jerry, Law Jerry Blackwell was the most popular wrestler in the AWA and they brought in Slaughter as this kind of savior figure and he just didn't catch right away. Nonetheless, as time went on in 1985, Slaughter uh, gained in popularity and was accepted by the AWA fans. Although he quite never reached, uh, quite never got close to the popularity he had in his heyday in the WWF. So he's at number seven here. Piper, they have his number one. Piper's hated, but he's also loved. Uh, he has a, you know, but he is hated. He was very controversial. And you have Tully Blanchard, Chris Adams, DiBiase, and Nikita Koloff at number five. Now, Nikita, Nikita, just his aura was amazing. Um, at this time in 1985. I mean, he had an incredible aura. Greg Valentine, number eight. Greg Valentine, man. I This guy, another, he's one of my favorites at this time. He had an incredible, I mean, he was one of these guys you just hated. If you, I mean, I didn't hate him, but a lot of fans did. He was just sadistic. Okay, so, uh, um, and then they have uh, 
DiBiase, you know, Randy Savage. <clears throat> and then you have here more of the, you know, the advertisements. Uh, you know, this is kind of cool. They would feature in this month in Pro Wrestling Illustrated, and they tell you the stories they were going to cover. Like this one, this upcoming Pro Wrestling Illustrated was going to cover the Great American Bash in 1985. And then they have all these little like cool advertisements for, you know, if you want to get buff and, you know, you're, they have this switchblade for sale. Um, more of the Tadler where they would give reports from the different territories. And uh, that's pretty much it. So that's, you know, again, uh, AWA t-shirts. You'd have like the Samoans, who, by the way, were in the AWA for a little while, 1985. Sergeant Slaughter, the High Flyers, Baron Von Raschke. Even Dr. D. David Schultz. So t-shirts, you can buy AWA t-shirts. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's um, back of the magazine here. And that's pretty much the review of Sports Review Wrestling, November 1985. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Bye.